Hi everyone, this is John Mathieu from LRAC from the Communities for Conservation team. Today we're at the Royal Botanic Garden interviewing Sir Professor Jeff Palmer on climate change and the environment. Hope you enjoy the video. Today we have the privilege of sitting with Professor Sir Jeff Palmer at the Royal Botanic Garden of Edinburgh. Professor Emeritus at the School of Life Sciences at Heriotwa University, Professor Palmer has been involved all his life in the brewing and distillery industry and has extensive knowledge and experience on climate change and environmental topics. Good morning, Professor Palmer. It's a pleasure to have you today on, uh, on a topic which I believe is dear to your heart. Yes. Let us just start with why is climate change so important in today's world? I think um, climate change is important in terms of um, we know scientifically that um, climate change is related to the amount of CO2 as carbon dioxide that we have in our, our, our atmosphere. And I know that, say, from about 1860 till about, say, 1998. Um, from 1998 until now, we've probably produced more carbon dioxide than we've ever produced in, mm. in, in the world before. Mm. So somehow there's been a significant increase mm. in carbon dioxide carbon dioxide production, which we know affect the ozone layer, mm -hmm. which in turn affect um, the temperature of the Earth. Climate change is a very big um, topic nowadays, you know, and, and politicians are starting to realize it in Scotland. Um, what is your, your personal um, experience of climate change, especially coming from, um, originally coming from Jamaica? Have you, have you experienced climate change in a, a particularly significant ways? Well, um, I, as you say, I'm from Jamaica, and I, uh, I left Jamaica a long time ago. So I've been in the, the UK since 1955. Mm -hmm. But um, as a child in Jamaica, one of the problems we, we had, and we sort of expected, expected it every year, was we had hurricanes. Um, and hurricanes are related to the climate. And if you live in Jamaica, as I did, they can be devastating. I remember um, in one hurricane we had, just to, 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 to tell you of the, the damage that a hurricane can do, that I remember distinctly on one of the hurricanes we had, I went to bed um, the, the night before, nine o'clock as usual, and I woke up about two o'clock and I looked up and the roof had gone. My God. So from a position of having a roof on, 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 on our house, I looked up and there was no roof and water it was just pouring into the house. Now, it was it, two things. It, it, hurricanes are very dangerous because of stuff lying around. They're also very dangerous in terms of um, the, 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 the economics. From reading the press and being in contact with my family in Jamaica, um, the hurricanes are more frequent and in fact, in many ways, are more devastating. And um, as you said, it's, it's um, hurricanes, but there are so many, there's a great diversity of, of um, um, you know, weather patterns which are changing and extreme weather events such as the floods and the droughts that we've seen in the south of the UK a few years ago when the floods in Scotland also last December. Um, so experts um, mentioned the fact that the Maldives might disappear in the you know in the coming decades because of sea level increase, um, do you think there is such a similar risk in the Caribbean? Well, in in, in the in the Caribbean, you know, we have a, a whole group of islands, um, probably over something like twenty four thirty in terms of size of the ones, and the in terms of the rising of the sea level which is one of the things we are concerned about. Basically, you have climate change, you have CO2 production, um, you warm up the our icebergs or the, the poles, mm -hmm. the sea level rises, and as you said, in the Maldives, but there are smaller islands in, in the Caribbean which are equally uh, a threat from sea level rises. Also, when sea level um, rises, I think you, fishing, um, uh, which is very important for uh, our, our community in the Caribbean. It's a protein source. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, 
very important for the diseases. But some people have said to me, ah, the CO2, you know, we have, it's only 0.04% of CO2 um, compose our atmosphere. Mm. But there's a balance in terms of 0.039 is probably what it has been for ages. Mm. You add another 0.01, that can cause a significant effect because it then tips over the what we call the, the balance of the relationship which nature has developed over millions of years. And I think today also is a great example of um, you know climate change and what might happen in Scotland in the next uh, few years. Uh, yesterday was a very warm day, 24, 25 degrees, probably the warmest day of the year. And today we're sitting here under you know a storm, a bit of rain, and um, and actually in Scotland the the Climate change effects will be more rain and and um, more heat during the summer. Um, so actually, people might not be so pleased with that effect, unfortunately. It affects our economy. It affects, <laughs> for example, I just passed some tourists who yesterday thought that that was going to last for a week, and today I saw them standing on the <laughs> bus, bus shelters. Mm. And um, you know, I think that kind of thing may seem small, but it is large because basically it affects. Um, the economy affects uh, uh, well-being. It affects mm -hmm. our lifestyle. Absolutely, it becomes less predictable. Mm -hmm. um, and when things become less predictable, the economists tell us the whole world economy changes. Do you think this term "climate refugees" is accurate? Well, I think um, sometimes in science, you know, we we are very um, uh, careful at trying to link. Um, things, um, especially correlations, it, it's a very tricky thing to do. But what I do know for certain is in, in my field, um, and my expertise is on cereals, and I think if there were no cereals in the world, we'd be in a whole lot of trouble. Um, whether it's wheat, barley, oats, rye, um, and in Africa we have sorghum. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. I had a student from Africa he wanted to work on barley. Now, he comes from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Now, I suggested that he worked on sorghum. And he wasn't quite sure what it was. <laughs> and I showed him in my room in Edinburgh a sample of sorghum. Now, sorghum is this native crop. It grows well in Africa. It doesn't require the same amount of water as barley does or maize. But he knew a lot about maize, mm -hmm. which failed, you know, which is not predictable, basically because it mm -hmm. requires a lot of water. So it's not a natural crop of Africa, maize. Sorghum is. Mm -hmm. Sorghum survives on low water levels. And he looked at the grain and he said he'd never seen it. But, you know, these are the aspects which are important, that we have a grain which for the world as a whole. And um, what is the value of that grain? What we managed to do was to get growers in Africa to use sorghum because with their money, they could um, set up good agricultural um, uh, conditions for growing sorghum. And now in Nigeria, Nigeria is the second biggest producer of sorghum in the world. But the important message here is that we don't know enough about tropical agriculture and the needs of the material there. So we've now transformed sorghum from a secondary crop to a major player because it can deal with reduced water conditions. Mm -hmm. If we now look at barley, say take Australia and the Middle East, now barley is a very primary crop mm -hmm. of Aust in Australia and the Middle East. Australia exports a lot of barley. The Middle East is always easy for food. Mm -hmm. We, I believe, or some of us believe that uh, uh, cereals per se originated in the Middle East. This is one of the ironies. And now they're struggling to grow cereals, and as you've said, the possibilities are that the climate change effect is affecting agriculture and people are moving into the cities. So climate change is affecting uh, our plants the way you may, not, you may not see it, because the barley looks the same, when it's been grown, but we're noticing structural and internal changes, which is affecting the processing economy and also, as you say, people 
movement mm -hmm. in terms of failing, of course. Mm -hmm. And I think this uh, global warming of, of who we were speaking just before the interview might affect what we can grow even here in Scotland. You had you mentioned having a student who uh, um, managed to grow banana in um, in Ireland banana. under a greenhouse, but who knows? Maybe in the next couple of years we might be able to grow fruits that we can't grow. Maybe not bananas. Yeah, but um, why not? The fact is that you've got a banana tree over there, <laughs> which I noticed. Um, and the point is that what we don't want to do is to, of course, it's good if we know how to do things, but it's much better for bananas to grow in the Caribbean or mm. in South America, where they are probably more natural and should have came to grow in their natural environment than we then have to set up a greenhouse. One last question, Professor Palmer. If you could change three things in society to make um, to make it greener, um, what would they be? May they be behavioral? May they be at the at the strategic I, I, level? I would say first uh, is to change attitudes. That with human beings, we're talking about attitude. It's it's not so much education. It's it's attitude. What we think we can do and what we think our rights are. A lot of people tend to do things because, well, I've got a right to do it, mm -hmm. um, whether it's right or wrong. As well, you see, people. Uh, so one, we have to change attitudes because people always say, "Well, it's not illegal," <laughs> um, and therefore I can do it. Because people have that attitude, then maybe in terms of the controlling behaviour, it's like we've done with. Um, in terms of our attitudes to other people's rights. I always say to my students, if you think people are fair, then look at our laws. We've had to have a law for gender, for LGBT, for race, for religion. For just about everything we do, we have to have a law. So, therefore, I feel that if we can't change attitudes, then we always need the law may have to help us in terms of preserving the planet for people who come after us, even our own relatives. In fact, my family, my wife, has gone on holiday and um, she's left a long note as usual. And the note says, make sure you do not put the wrong um, stuff in the wrong bin. <laughs> make sure the bin is put out on such and such a day. And if you don't do it, I will hide your beer. <laughs> so Excellent. that covers the point of attitude and the law <laughs> in terms of the change of behavior. But um, those are the two things I think are important. And the third thing is that we should uh, look at a world of a thousand years' time. And what I say, my wife has always said to me, is your grandchildren will have a responsibility to your grandchildren's children and children. Mm. And uh, an animal will do anything to save its offspring. Why can't a human being do the same to save mm -hmm. its own offspring? On that inspiring note, Professor Palmer, thank you very much for that insightful conversation and uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you for watching the video. Big thanks also to Jenny and Ellie for facilitating the interview. Thank you obviously to Sir Professor Jeff Palmer for taking his time. And thank you to the Royal Botanic Garden for hosting us today. Please make sure you subscribe to our video channel or leave a comment below. And also make sure you check our Facebook page or the LRED website. Until next time.